Let's give Jesus a great hand clap of praise. God is great this afternoon. Amen. You may be seated. It's a great honor to have you. Thank you for coming to this worship experience. We're glad that you slept in and came to church. Come on, somebody. I want to welcome all you watching on Facebook and live stream. We're so excited about what God is doing. Now, because of all that God is doing, we're starting a clothing line here. And so, um, <laughs> just kidding. But after the service, I heard there's 10 shirts left, five extra large, five 2X. And so if you want one, we're selling them. You can go out and get one. We're honored that you would even consider uh, to get one of these and to wear it. And hopefully you feel good about wearing it. And they're, um, you know, they're great to start you know, conversations about church and then God, of course, and invite people. So if that suits you, it'd be great for you to get one. And we're um, just having some new clothing line coming out. Come on, somebody. We're going to be hip. All right. Great to have you. We're starting a new series uh, this weekend called Neighborhood Watch. How many know that we are connected to one another? And that God asks you and I to do two things. He sums up the Bible in two things. I've, I've, and I mentioned this a lot here at City Church, but I'm going to come at it from a different angle uh, this afternoon. But he asks us to simply love him and love people. And if you're comparing the two, maybe we shouldn't do that, but just for today, let's Let's do it. You know, loving God can be a challenge, can it? And, you know, dealing with that. But how many know probably loving people is even more of a challenge? Can I get a witness, somebody? How about forgiving people? Anyone? Anyone in here? Okay, thank you for one honest person. That's all right. Thank you. How about loving the unlovable, loving people that don't love you? That's a hard thing. Loving Purdue fan, that's a hard thing. Loving Patriot fan, that's a really hard thing. That's right. We're, we're working on that. Let them go, Jesus. Let them go. And so... How many know that we're challenged with this? Now, the reason why that I'm, I'm on this subject often here at City is because I believe that when a church, you and I, the church, no matter where we're at in our faith, just starting out or we're, we've been doing it for years, if you and I will embrace the idea of the neighborhood watch and see other people through the eyes and the lens of God, what can God do in our lives? What could God do in our cities, our neighborhoods? I believe it would be unthinkable. And it's just one small step that you and I can take. And so I want to preach a message entitled, Who is my neighbor? Everyone say, Who is my neighbor? If you have your Bibles, please turn to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 10. I'm going to kind of set this up because I'm not going to read the whole thing. But a young man comes to Jesus and he asks Jesus, What's the most important commandment? Jesus is clear, and he quotes from the law of Moses, and he says that we must love the Lord our God with all of our heart, soul, and mind. And then the second one is equal. It's love your neighbor as yourself. But notice verse 29. This is interesting. The man wanted to justify his actions. Now, let's stop right there. That means to me that he had an issue with people and that he wasn't doing something right, and that's why he needed to justify his actions. And he asked the question... And who is my neighbor? So Jesus answers this question with a story. And Jesus replied with a story. A Jewish man was traveling from Jerusalem down to Jericho. He was attacked by bandits. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him up, left him half dead beside the road. By chance, a priest came along, but when he saw the man lying there, he crossed to the other side of the road and passed him by. A temple assistant was even worse. Watch this. He walked over and looked at him lying there. But he also passed by on the other side. Then a despised Samaritan came along, and when he saw the man, he felt compassion for him. I'm going to skip a few verses, but we know that he, he bandaged his wounds. He paid his hotel bill. He nursed him to health. Then in verse 36, now which of these three would you say was a neighbor to the man who was attacked by bandits, Jesus asked. The man replied, the one who showed him mercy. Notice this last verse. Jesus said, yes. Now go and do the same. So, Father, I thank you, Lord, for this 1230 worship experience. We're honored to have every person here. Lord, fill us with your presence. Protect us in this room and as we travel. Lord, let the word of the Lord go forth in here and through Facebook and live stream and touch our hearts. Thank you for your presence. Thank you so much for what you've done. We give you praise. In Jesus' name, everyone said, amen. This question is interesting. Who is my neighbor? Jesus was clear. 
He didn't mince words. He meant what he said. And yet the man wanted to justify himself. And I think this is indicative of you and I. If we're honest in our everyday life, how do you and I practically practice our faith? Take it from ambiguity and we bring it down to Monday morning. And this question is speaking to a challenge that not only this young guy had, but really that we have. As we get older, how many know that we go through things? People leave us. You deal with abandonment. You rejection, lying, slander, gossip, maybe divorce, you know, maybe an affair, you know, hate, anger, racism. It just keeps going. And when those things happen to us and more, what the enemy wants to do, I believe, I want to set this up and then I'm going to break down these three people in the story. But I believe the main thing the enemy wants to do, and the enemy meaning, you know, the devil, the Bible calls him Satan. He's the enemy of all humanity. But for you and I that after we receive Jesus, he's a defeated enemy. Amen. But he's real, right? I believe after we come to Christ, if you don't know him today, receive Jesus. After we come to Christ, I believe his main operation is to shut down our heart from God and even more so with people. Because it's easier to do that with people. Live full of distrust. Live abrasive or passive aggressive. Whatever or however that comes through. Live as a skeptic. And as a cynic, totally be disconnected because when he does that to us, then it's easy for you and I to harden our heart. And when we harden our heart, I believe he can fill our heart with evil things. This is why as we grow older and as a Christ follower, we have to be intentional at keeping our heart tender, not only to God, but to people in general, don't we? Because if we don't, it's easy to... To maybe, you know, say I love God, but really be totally disconnected from others. We have to understand that the enemy uses hurt people to hurt people. And so all of us are walking around hurt at some level. And the enemy wants to prey on that and really um, multiply that to a point where we are locked in. But Jesus has something better. Amen. So Jesus is answering the question, who is my neighbor? And he's talking about this story. I'm going to set this up. I'm going to repeat what we just read. There was a Jewish man who was traveling 12 miles from Jerusalem to Jericho. I've been to both those cities. Jericho today is full of palm trees. It's lush. It's like a tropical place. It's beautiful. He was traveling there. We don't know if he was with people or not, but I believe maybe by himself. He was attacked by a gang. He was beat, robbed, and left half dead on the side of the road. And then these three people are in the story, and I believe they reflect tendencies that you and I have in this room and online. And as I'm going through this, just be open to receive as I'm going to share a tendency that maybe I have as well. The first person that comes by this man is a priest, which really today would be a pastor. How many love pastors? Praise God. Amen. All right. <laughs> Pray you love me. Okay. Let's keep going. So he, he's walking, I believe, on the same side of the street because the Bible says he, he sees him, then he goes to the other side. So he sees this man here in the condition that he's in, and he goes to the other side of the, of the street. I want to set each of these characters up biblically so we have a context. Priests in the Old and New Testament were strict, ultra strict about the law. The law was 613 rules that Jewish people had to obey to be right with God. Aren't you glad for Jesus? Amen. So priests, these priests were strident and very strict. We know that because in Matthew chapter 23, Jesus rebukes them and says, how dare you make it hard for people to come to me. You load them down with heavy rules. And so they were people that they had the Bible, they knew the Bible, but Paul said the letter of the Bible by itself kills. But the spirit of the Bible gives life. So you and I, in other words, can be strict and have all the rules down and be lifeless in God. And the priest had all the rules, they knew all the regulations, and they imposed that on other people. In other words, they, they uh, made points, but they missed hearts. They made doctrinal statements, but they missed the visitation of Jesus in their life. They were those type of people that would often, if you read the Gospels, you'll see this. They would probably go up to this guy and say, well, he probably did something to deserve this. Um, he's, not, he's not first, second, or third Baptist. Um, 
He wasn't Kojic. He wasn't Pentecostal. So, you know, he did something to deserve it. So just go ahead and deal with it and judge people based on their condition. Now, this is maybe, I would never do that, but I want you just to listen here. Because these tendencies, I believe, are easily adopted today by us. How does it come through today? Okay. This would come through today. Maybe you're not a priest. I'm not a priest. Like maybe we think of it in the Old and in, in New Testament. But you and I could easily gravitate to begin to major on the minors. And make a lot of doctrinal points and miss hearts along the way. Know what the Bible says, which is very important, and we'll help you do that if you don't, but not have the Spirit of God in it and become full of rules and regulations and look down religious noses at people and say, if you don't become like us, you don't belong. You don't look like us, you don't think like us and vote like us or whatever, then you don't belong here. Now, now we don't do that here, but this is more common than maybe we think. And in reality, this is a bad attitude that Jesus really never adopted. You and I can easily gravitate to this because we're dealing as humans with pride, don't we? This position is prideful. You must have done something to deserve that. Look at those people. Look at them over there. They blah, 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 blah. They blah, 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 blah. We are right. They are wrong. You see, priests, if you study the scriptures, were very concerned about being clean. They wouldn't eat with unclean um, you know, dishes or cups. I'm not talking about like a dishwasher. I'm talking about they had ceremonial type stuff. If a woman was unclean, if someone was sick, they wouldn't want anyone to touch them. They had this attitude of we're clean, you're dirty. And today it's common for us as people to maybe adopt I'm right, they're wrong. I'm clean, they're not. I don't want to mess with this. This is a little bit too messy. I'm going to go to the other side. But ladies and gentlemen, it's never us and them. It's we as the human family. We all are dirty and we all need Jesus every single day. And so for us, come on, let's give him praise. That's a good place to clap. And... You and I must resist this attitude. Say, well, I'm not like that. We're not like that at City, and you're not. I mean, I mean uh, and you're right, we're not. But these attitudes can be a temptation, and they will be a temptation that will come back to try to knock on our heart to see if we'll adopt them. And you and I can easily gravitate and be, well, you know, I mean, you must have deserved it, or you're, I mean, dirty, and a little dirt hurt no one, folks. And you and I have to understand that Jesus does not want us to be, you know, belligerent about the rules. He wants us to be filled with grace. Yesterday in our, in our leadership retreat, our guest minister, he said this statement, truth without grace is mean. How many have ever met a mean Christian? Just whacking people. Knowing good and well, God saved them, cleaned them, and protected them from being embarrassed. And let alone so many other things. And now they want to push it on people and judge people. This priest was full of religious, you know, righteousness. And, and, and we know that from scriptures because they played that out continually. And so he looked at them and he went to the other side. You and I must avoid that. The second one was even worse. He was a Levite. Most versions say a Levite. This version says a temple assistant. He did even worse. He walks over, looks at him. Hmm, that's interesting. And then walks away. This would be equivalent to a preacher. Lord bless the preachers. Amen. I want to give context. The tribe of Levi, there was 12 tribes in, of the Jewish people. Levi, his name means attached to God. It was Moses' family. They had the privilege of carrying, in the Old Testament particularly, they physically, with poles, carried the Ark of the Covenant, which represented the presence of God. They would... Uh, live at the temple or at the church, and they would, you know, take care of it and make sure everything was okay. They took care of all the furniture in the temple, in the Old Testament especially. They had the privilege of being close to God, physically carrying God, being attached to God, and being intimate with God. They had this privilege. Yet this Levite goes over and looks at him and then walks away and doesn't help. How does this translate to you and I? 
You see, you and I, and this is probably more so for Christ followers. This is a temptation. One of my friends has a great message. It's titled, The Sin of Being Saved. You see, after you and I come to Jesus, it's easy for us to, beget, uh, to begin to get inward. And we love the glory of God, and, and, and I love the presence of God. But this Levite, he got to carry the presence of God physically, but he didn't give it away spiritually. You and I are called to be touched by the presence of God, but folks, we have to give it away. It's easy for us as Christ followers in churches to get inward. And, and what happens is, is when they get inward, we get detached from the people around us and we start, being, uh, uh, we start becoming church critics, choir critics, style judges. And we start debating on topics that mean nothing to the people around us. We start getting boiled down and it's Joel Osteen, right? Oh, God. Bishop T.D. Jakes, I never see him hold the Bible. I don't know if he's even preaching the word. Oh, the lights, and this is like a concert in here. The lights are low. Woo, glory. We start talking about, you know, I like this style. I like Hillsong. I like William McDowell. I like this. I like that. I like, he preached an hour. He preaches really good. He preaches 10 minutes. I love it, you know. Start talking about things that mean nothing to the people lying on the side of the road. Hear me. This afternoon. This is a common trap. I just want the presence of God. I just want to be touched by God. I just want to worship for two hours. I love to worship. But folks, I love all of you being here. This is amazing what God's doing. But we just can't just be us and no more and sing kubaya and just be in this room. We have to go out and reach someone and love someone and do something for someone. We have to get out of ourselves. These are, and these are strong statements, but listen to them in its entirety. What good is doctrine? Good to know what we believe. What good, though, is doctrine if it's not translated on Monday morning in a practical way? What, it, what good is knowing all the old hymns and new songs, but never loving our neighbor? What good is the presence of God? And I love the presence of God. He's here right now. What good, though, is the presence of God... If we just hoard it and never share it. See, the young man asked Jesus, who is my neighbor? Is my neighbor those people that I choose to live by? Is my neighbor those people that I choose to love because they love me back and they look like me and they're cool and they're pretty and they're nice and they're hip or they live in my rich neighborhood or they're the neighbor in my ghetto or they're my roommate or who is my neighbor? Well, Jesus said in this text, our neighbor is anyone. In our life, not just the people that we choose, not just the people that we uh, prefer, not just the people that we are attracted to, but everyone, whoever, that is our neighbor. And there's no question in my mind that in this room and online, some of us are lying on the side of the road. Maybe not physically. In our country, we're blessed. Some people do lie physically. This really isn't about of the homeless, but we love the homeless, don't we? But this really, I'm not talking about that, but we see people sometimes on the side of the road. But in our country, it's, it's probably more internal, maybe spiritually, physically, financially, emotionally, merely racially. They're lying on the side of the road. And what Jesus is saying for us, and, 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 and maybe you're there, and if you're there, I want you to know that you're accepted here. I don't care how dirty you are. I don't care what you're dealing with. We love you. We're not perfect. We're going to pick you up. We're going to help you get healed, and we're going to move forward. Everyone is someone here at City Church. Hear me. Everyone is someone. We love you. We're here for you. But in this room and online, there are some lying down, and others of us maybe don't feel like we're lying down, or maybe we are in some parts of our life. It's okay. Here's the deal. When we come upon someone, will we become strident and rule-based, churchy and judgmental and all blah, 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 and walk on the other side? Well, will, we, will we take the temptation of being church-absorbed and inward-focused and just give me, give me, give me, and I just want this and I just want to be in the presence of God for hours. Man, I love the presence of God. I need more of the presence of God. But, man, at some folks, I think God's saying, get out and go do something. <laughs> I've been with you all day. Who else are you with? <laughs> Come on, man. I just want to pray all day long. I think God wants us to pray more. We need to pray more. 
But how about we pray as we go, and we go as we pray, and we go to work on time, and, we, and, and, and we're good on the job. Thank you for two amens in the front row. Mm -hmm. Right? We show up to class. We, we, we don't get so spiritual, I just can't work. I'm just lost in the glory. Get your butt up and get to work. And all of a sudden, the third one comes. We have a priest. He is strident. We know this from Scripture. I'm not making this up. We know they have the propensity of doing this. And he's judging and he's not helping. We have now a preacher or a Levite who's physically being able to carry the presence of God but not spiritually giving anything away. Becoming absorbed in church world. And I put this in our notes, or in my notes. We don't have time to judge church stuff when people are lying on the road. It's a waste of our time. And it's sad. Now I know we don't do this here, but I felt led to preach this. And then the third person comes. You know, we call this in church the story of the good Samaritan. But if you really see it, Jesus doesn't even call him good. Jesus said, then a despised Samaritan comes by and shows compassion. He didn't even give the guys some credit and said a good Samaritan <laughs> or a good guy or a nice man or something. He just says a despised Samaritan comes by and shows compassion. I want to just highlight those two thoughts because... I need to give context. Today, in the Middle East, there's racial tension all over the place. But particularly in Israel, the Jews believe that they are God's rightful people. And the Palestinians believe that they are God's rightful people. Because guess what? They both have the same granddaddy, Abraham. Because he didn't do what God said to do. And his wife said, go get another woman. He said, okay, I will. And then they got two people groups. And they're fighting. That hasn't just started. It's, it's been happening for thousands of years. In the Bible days... The Jews thought Samaritans as, as not fully human. They were quibbling on who was the rightful people, who would worship where, who had the right to this, to that. And they had racial tension. Please note, Jesus broke racial tension. Please read John chapter 4 on your own as he went to someone, quote, unquote, not fully human. And Jesus loves all people. Racism does, has, has no place in the church, no place in the Bible, no place in our hearts as a Christ follower. That's a good place to give God praise. But this is what was happening. And Jesus says, a despised Samaritan. I love the fact that he sees this Jewish man who thinks of him as not human. Think about that. And he goes over and has compassion he then picks him up on his animal, takes him to a hotel, pays the bill, bandages his wounds, and tells the owner that if this is too much for what I have, I'll come back and make up the difference and pay off the debt, take care of him. This is showing the heart of God. This is showing the heart of Christ. A couple of thoughts took out to me. Notice, if you think I mean, about this, this Samaritan is seeing a Jewish man who claims that he's not fully human. So to do what he did, he had to overcome what others thought and do something for God. Or else if he wouldn't have overcome what others thought, he would have probably left him there and said, just have at it. For us today, you and I can overcome what other people think. And we can act for God. And really, quite frankly, at 1230, we need to overcome what other people think and act for God. Because newsflash. Every day of our life, someone thinks something wrong about you and I. They think about our gender, our ethnicity, our education, our money, our this, our that, our style, our clothes, whatever it may be. They're looking at us through a jaded lens. But I'm glad Jesus doesn't. He sees us all the same and we're anointed and we're prepared to do something for him. Now, please hear me. I think it's great to live uh, with career goals and have a professional goal and, and to make money and have vacation. Why do you think God made Maui? He made Maui to go to it. Have retirement. Work hard. Have fun. Have hobbies. Enjoy life. I believe in that. I want to do that. I encourage everyone in here and online to do that. And I believe we can do all that and still live for eternity. And we must live for eternity because you and I, through all of our blessing, you and I can still impact. Really, we need to impact at least one life for eternity. 
And, and, and it's amazing how God can use an imperfect person with issues like myself and, and yourself. And he can come through us and he can use us through our ups and our downs and our this and our that. And he can help us be used by his grace to love someone else. Who is my neighbor? Not the people that we choose. It's the people that God brings in our life. Then he overcomes what others think and he acts for God, especially with this Jewish man who thinks he's not human, he loves him anyway. Then the Bible says specifically he has compassion. Please hear this. When you and I have compassion on people, it's because we remember where we were. This is so important for us that you and I as Christ followers, that you and I never forget what we once were, did, and where we did it. I don't want to think about that anymore. I just, I'm new in the blood. No, 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 stop. I've heard that jargon. Stop it. You and I, it's good that we remember where we've come from. Therefore, you and I continually show compassion. And when we come up on somebody, we don't say, well, they must have deserved it. They must have sinned. Or I just want the glory of God. I just want to be in the presence of God. I don't have time for that. But rather we say, oh, 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 wait a minute. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. I remember when I did A, B, and C. And if God wouldn't have touched me, I'd still be doing A, B, and C. Therefore, I have to show compassion to all people because I didn't deserve it. Come on. Isn't that true? I didn't deserve it. But it's so easy to be, uh, to be tempted to think, well, well, well I'm holy I'm the elect of God. And, 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 and man, I, well, you knucklehead, you, were, you and I were out, whatever. <laughs> this is scriptural. Hear this quote. 2 Peter chapter 1, the apostle Peter says, if you lack these seven things, I'm going to finish with the final two. If you lack these seven things, the final two, if you lack brotherly love, and if you lack love, you have forgotten what you were forgiven of. You and I, folks, can never afford to forget who we were and who we would be without him. And I know this is basic. Man, he's preaching this again. No, no, no. Please hear me afresh and anew with ears to hear. Because the temptation to be a religious zealot is strong. The temptation... To be strident is strong. The temptation to come inward and just talk about church and, you know, is Jesus, you know, is he coming back in the rapture or is he not? And, and tongues and not, and, you know, and no tongues. Bethel, Hillsong, blah, 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 blah. Stop it. They could care less of our groups. They don't know them. Why are we sitting around arguing and debating when people are lying? On the road. I'm going to go up to someone and say, do you like Bethel or Hillsong? I wonder. Do you like William McDowell? <laughs> oh, okay. Never mind. I mean, we're, we're not doing that. Are you Calvinist or Pentecostal? I just wonder, what, do, you, do you like a Hammond B3 organ? Or do you just like pipe organ? What do you like? Do you like long church services or short? Which do you like? Oh, okay. Well, God bless you. I hope you make it. Foolishness happens all the time. Folks, our moment is now. In closing, I want to encourage you. I get messages in weird, at weird times, in weird places. I've wrote messages in barber shops, sometimes at the bar. I get messages. It's pretty amazing. Um, that was a joke. I was kidding. <laughs> he saw me there. I did. I saw you. <laughs> Everyone's awake now. Praise the Lord. <laughs> In closing, I wrote this message on Monday. I was praying about it. My three boys are in karate and in basketball. We're never home. One of my son's basketball teams, the coach has been absent for different things. So me and my cousin have filled in to coach during the practice. Went to, wrote my message and studied and took my boys to, to 
basketball. Got Skittles and having a good time and eating and joking and helping coach these five, five and six-year-olds. There's one young boy on the team. He's awkward. He's shy. He's afraid. He's sweet. He's timid. And I've taken to him, just wanted to you know, make him included and just act stupid and love, you know, love on him and didn't think a thing about it. I've noticed it's his grandmother that brings him. I've just seen her now about three times. He goes to her for water, and I know it's her. And after that practice on this past Monday, after I wrote this message, see, there's no accidents. God, see, God, God does things. She came up to me, and she says, I want to thank you for taking a little extra time for my grandson. I said, well, sure, it's no big deal. I'm not even the coach. I'm just here jacking around. She said, no, I want to thank you. She said, I'm 63 years old, and I'm starting over. I'm now the full guardian of my grandson and my granddaughter, his sister. I'm raising them. He's been through a lot in his life. She, she explained some things to me of why he's the way he is. And she said, he's been through a lot of tragedy. And in the midst of all that, I was, I was kind of responding. I said, well, I believe God has a plan for it. I just kind of just spoke it. She said, I believe that. And... Uh, she said, he's been through tragedy. And I just said, you know, ma'am, if I can ask, what are you talking about? What, what tragedy? And he said, she said, well, two years ago, he was three. His sister, I think, was two. And they were at home, and they were in a room, the two kids, their mom and dad, and they got into a fight. And their mother drew a gun and shot and killed their father, shot him four times in front of these two kids and murdered him on the spot. I was like, oh, my God, I mean, are you serious? I, I mean... She didn't tell me if that was her son or if that was her daughter. Obviously, it was one of them. A three-year-old witnessing something that you and I probably will never see. I pray we don't. Seeing his mother murder his father in front of them. It broke my heart. She said, he's just now beginning to love again. And I thought about this message. Hear me. God's not asking you to be Billy Graham. He's not asking you to be Mother Teresa. He's not asking you to be Kurt Franklin. He's just saying, look, who is my neighbor? Look in the classroom. Look on the job. Look in your family. At your neighbor physically. Look, I'm just showing up to basketball practice, having a good time with my sons. And then this message hits me right in the face. This little boy is trying to survive, he's lying on the road. And we don't have time to be some false priest or some inward thinking preacher. The only thing we have time for is to be a good Samaritan. And when that comes to our attention and we see someone lying on the road, we don't sit there and walk by. We reach out and touch someone. We reach out and love. We do whatever we can. I'm wondering this afternoon, who in your life is lying on the road. There's someone. There's someone. I'll never forget when a young guy called me. He said, man, PD, you prayed for me four years ago. He said, I left the church. He said, pray for me, man, I have HIV. Pray for me. Yeah, man. We're in a public place. I stood up and I bear hugged this guy. He's my neighbor. lying on the road in your life. The greatest thing you and I could ever do for our God is to help someone else come to Him. We can't take things and rings, boats and coats, as one person said. The only thing we can take into eternity 
is the people we give Jesus to. And I'm asking you this afternoon, because my heart was broken of a little boy. There's no doubt in my mind that in our lives today, people are lying on the road. Some of you are lying on the road, and we're going to help you get up. Because Jesus is good enough. He's great enough. He's merciful enough. He's gracious enough. And if God could get me off the road, he can get anyone off the road. And I believe that the best is yet to come. Let's give this Jesus a great and clap for praise. He's worthy. He's worthy. Come on, give him praise. His mercy is new every morning. Great is his faithfulness. Great is his faithfulness. Great is his faithfulness. Let's stand to our feet, you online, respond to God. Let's bow our hearts in our, in our head, please, just to respect everyone. This is why we want to build. This is why we want to double our children's space, because of boys like him. Why we want to double our teenage space, young adults, college students, because, because of people like him. In our community right now, in our family, there's so many thousands of people that need Jesus. So in this moment, I would ask you, and who is my neighbor, what's your next step? I think practically it would be this week. I wasn't even looking for it. It just came to me. If you and I can just be aware when it comes to us. And when it comes, we move. And we love. And we move forward. Others of you, if you have never received Jesus, receive him today. If you want to get water baptized, do it today. Or sign up today and do it in two weeks. Go to build next week. Be a part of a life group. Join the dream team. I don't know. Take your next step. Appropriate what you've heard. God will move. As heads are bowed, you would say, Pastor Dave, I've never received Jesus in my life and or I have, but I'm disconnected from God and I want to reconnect with him. If that's you, either one, and you want to take that step right now, go ahead and raise your hand to heaven. I want to pray for you to receive Jesus today. God bless you, I see it. God bless you, I see it. God bless you, I see it. Amen. And that awesome people are coming to Jesus today. Thank you. I see it. As heads are about a little bit longer, um, my propensity would probably be the second one in that I'm so, I'm leading the church and, I, and I'm called to do it and I love doing it, but my temptation would be that I get inward and I become detached from what's around me. Which one is a temptation for you? Even the Good Samaritan, are you tempted to let what other people think of you block you? It's okay because we're all people, but Jesus is reaching for us so that we can reach for someone else. And you would say today, you know, Pastor Dave, I want help. I want support. I want to I want to step out. When I see someone lying on the road, I want to stop and I want to do my part and help them. If that's you and you want that, go ahead and raise your hand. I want to pray for you right now at 1230. Thank you so much all over this room. Thank you. Follow me in this prayer so no one's left out. Everyone, please say, Lord Jesus, I give you my life. And please forgive me for anything that's wrong. I turn from it and I say yes to you. Through the Holy Spirit, I choose to see my neighbor, to love my neighbor. I choose you. Use me for your glory. In Jesus' name. Father, I pray for this great group in this room and online. God, help us. Help us to see. Help us to hear. We're broken ourselves. We need you, Jesus. We need each other. And then when we come in contact with someone else, we follow what the Samaritan did. Use us, Jesus.